Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this uh, Trinity P3 webinar, Reducing Carbon Pollution in Marketing Communications from Out of Home to Point of Purchase. My name is Darren Woolley, CEO of Trinity P3. And uh, before we get into the webinar, I just want to uh, do some housekeeping. So thanks for joining us. We'll be finishing in one hour at uh, 17.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time. We'd ask you to ask questions at any time, uh, preferably using the Q&A function on the Zoom uh, platform. So please feel free to uh, ask your questions as we go along. And uh, rather than having a Q&A at the end, we'll probably address those questions as we go through. We're also recording the session for future use and there'll be an email going out in the next 24 hours with a link to the recording so that you can uh, view it again. Okay, so today I'm joined by Joy Murray, Senior Research Fellow, Faculty of Science at the University of Sydney, and Mr. Christopher Sewell, Managing Director of the Gaia Partnership, but also Business Director of uh, our Environmental Services here at Trinity P3. Welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you. Darren. Okay, I'll just, uh, there we go. So, um, look, uh, it's, from my perspective, this is a issue that's been around for more than 15 years, uh, but it's one that uh, seems to get put off every time there's uh, something else comes up like a uh, recession or a, or a pandemic. Um, and yet there's very good business reasons for us to be addressing uh, climate uh, uh, crisis and also uh, the CO2 emissions that are actually uh, driving this. But from a marketing perspective, it often seems that people are uh, putting their head in the sand or not seeing the role that uh, marketing plays in actually participating and, and contributing to the uh, climate change crisis that we're facing. Chris, uh, I know that from personal experience, we worked on a project what was that, uh, 2007, when a brewing company launched a carbon neutral beer, it was called, and uh, you were called in to look at it because while they'd done all of the audit to offset the carbon in manufacturing, packaging and distribution, they overlooked one area. Can you uh, share that with us? Yeah, thanks, Darren. I, I think they um, overlooked uh, mar marketing and advertising completely when they were looking at uh, the plant and the manufacture of the beer and the distribution. And uh, we were called in at the very last minute because um, they went, oops, there's all this money being spent on promoting this wonderful beer that is claimed to be carbon neutral. So we had a look at all the various channels and, and did a measurement around them. But the one that uh, stood out, which everyone seemed to overlook was around the country, they had these super sites, billboards. And on these billboards that they were promoting this beer, with all its claims and all around it were these wonderful plants and trees actually growing to show what a wonderful thing this was doing for the planet. And uh, what they were doing was, uh, as the sun went down in the afternoon, these massive great big floodlights came on to actually light up the messaging and the plants to tell everybody throughout the night what a wonderful carbon neutral beer was. But they didn't realize the impact of the uh, CO2 from those emissions coming through the electricity grid to power these. And when we pointed it out, they are very quickly, so there was some, uh, they did actually understand um, that this was a bit of a problem, from a, not from a claim point of view, but from an environmental point of view, they put uh, a load of uh, early uh, solar panels up to power these things at night. So um, once people actually understood, they actually did something about it. But the, the common thing is people don't even look. And Chris, this of course was in an era when uh, people weren't actually looking to reduce uh, CO2 emissions, they were simply adding it up and then paying for offsets, weren't they? There was a big business going at the time in uh, buying offsets to make yourself carbon neutral. In yeah, that, that was, that was the, the easy thing to do, was to, to actually look at uh, the emissions within what people would claim was their boundaries and then actually buy some cheap offsets from somewhere. So there was no real drive to reduce the emissions. It was more to tally up 
and um, and then offset. And we saw that a lot in the, in the print industry it was happening. They were just measuring tiny bits of the manufacturing process and then claiming carbon neutrality and running the green flag up the front of the premises and telling the world to come to them because they were carbon neutral and, and, and go print with them. But um, a lot of those were false claims. Yeah. Now, Joy, from your perspective, is it very common for people to, you know, overlook parts in the uh, supply chain when they're looking for where the carbon contribution is coming from? I mean, it's oh, incredibly complex, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely it is. I just want to add a story though to Chris's story because at that same time, Chris, when you were looking at this beer advertising, I was in Las Vegas. <laughs> I was staying in a hotel <laughs> where they had this little sign that said, please put your towels on the floor if you want them washing, etc. and hang them up if you don't. And so I dutifully hung my towels up. I went outside at night and the whole of the building was lit up <laughs> brilliantly. <laughs> and I did mention this, but I didn't get the response you did, Chris. <laughs> I don't think anybody really wanted to hear what I had to say. But yes, it's the same kind of thing. Exactly. But yeah, um, what was your question again? Very uh, but, but <laughs> when, when we're looking for carbon contribution in a yeah. supply chain, yeah. you know, how wide do you have to go? Because okay. you know, they, I'm, I'm sure the brewers and, and their uh, auditors thought yeah. that they'd covered everything as far as manufacturing, uh, yeah, uh, right. uh, packaging and distribution. Yeah. But it's often um, people overlook areas uh -huh. because they're maybe not so obvious or they just don't think about it. That's right. I think with, uh, in the days of uh, carbon neutral that uh, you were also talking about before, um, people just counted their emissions on site, you know, the kinds of stuff they were doing, driving a car or whatever they were doing on site, and, thought, and, and their electricity bills and maybe their water bill, um, and that they thought was it. Well, of course, then there's the supply of your electricity coming from somewhere and creating emissions, but then there's everything else. Everything, every chain of supply that you set off by any of your purchases or anything that you do on site, you've got a chain upstream of, um, of activities um, and production, a, a production chain. So every one of those, um, everything that you buy has emission implications upstream from you. Um, and we did a lot of work around that at one time because about in 2009, um, the World Resources Centre were looking at um, revising the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. Um, I don't know if you know about the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, but they count greenhouse gas as tier one if it's greenhouse gases that are emitted on site, on your premises. Tier two are the emissions that come from the production of the energy that you use. And tier three are all the rest. Well, um, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol was only interested in tier one and tier two. Tier three, all the rest was far too hard. How can we know that? Um, well, because the business that I'm in, the, the team that I work with, integrated sustainability analysis, looking at tier three um, is exactly what we do. We can trace the supply chain infinitely um, and produce results infinitely for any, sect any part of your supply chain. And so we took issue with this and we joined all the technical advisory groups that we could to help to uh, have our input into the uh, greenhouse gas protocol upgrades, which meant sort of being up at three o'clock in the morning because this was all conducted out of the US. So, uh, but it was worth it because we did get our message across eventually. <laughs> Um, I mean, shall I go on? Do you want the example? Uh, well, 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 I, I, I think I'm we need to take over. I'm interested in that in that point because when you talk about uh, tier two being about energy production, and mm -hmm. especially in Australia, we do have a big issue with many of the largest emitters of CO two being um, power generation mm -hmm. companies. That's yep. correct, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Because we all, when we did footprints for people. We always found that uh, uh, an organization based in Tasmania had um, a smaller contribution from tier two because most of it was hydro. Of course, yeah. And then, um, yeah, yeah. Things so, like, um, we did a lot of work for Sydney Water and Vic, Vic Water and the footprint in Sydney for, uh, the, uh, for Sydney Water 
the greenhouse gas footprint was always higher than Victoria because we're hillier and they used a lot more pumping. Okay, that's interesting. Because, mm. Chris, the reason I raise that is that there is, seems, seems to be, and it gets played back to, to us quite regularly, a belief that uh, if you take things out of the, you know, w uh, physical domain into the digital domain, that somehow that will uh, reduce the carbon footprint. It seems to be visible, I, I think, and that was uh, the easy thing to do was to not use paper and then you solved all your environmental problems as a business. So that was the big push to start with, which was you know, credible in a way, but um, it really didn't solve the problem because uh, we all know there's these massive companies like Google and Facebook have uh, enormous server farms which chew up a massive amount of power and always attempting because they have to call those things and to call those massive server farms, um, that creates a lot of electricity has to be used, which is mm -hmm. back into the, again, depending where it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure everyone well, is familiar with the, a lot of those farms they're trying to put in the Arctic Circle. So they don't have to spend so much uh, electricity <laughs> and carbon to actually uh, to cool them down. But uh, that's the big driver. And they're just getting, as data grows, you know, Moore's law, you know, every, everything's doubling. The amount of data that's fed through, the complexity and size of files that we share now. And a lot of that work is, yes, we do watch our Netflix, but we also look at a lot of um, digital marketing now, which is yeah, this massive, massive files that are stored somewhere. And when you store those files, there is a footprint which no one sees. And it will be classed as scope three for mm -hmm. most yeah companies it would not be in scope one because it's not directly purchased or it's directly within their boundary but it does have a big influence on on, on that company's overall footprint mm -hmm. right so what you're saying is because the power uh, you, electricity usage is not directly used by the company so there was an example um, of a, a research paper uh, around Facebook and the actual contribution of using uh, Facebook advertising. Yeah, um, we did that uh, with Joy and uh, the, the master's uh, students. Uh, I think it's about, it's getting on for two years ago, two, yeah. three years ago now. Um, again, there was a belief that uh, as, as Facebook advertising started to explode and dominate the market, um, there was a feeling that people going away from newspaper advertising or from printed material if they did everything in the online environment and uh, uh, sent Facebook advertising to people when they were on their computers or what, wherever else they were, that would actually make the whole uh, environmental uh, footprint for the business go away. But there was no measurement. There was no evidence of that at all. So we set out and did a, a good research project with a, a couple of the students that came back and demonstrated it was actually quite large. Now, as an individual piece of uh, when you get served a, um, a banner ad and while you're searching for something from Facebook, the amount of carbon in that is, is small. But when you actually look at the volume that's involved in the amount of those that go out, it's actually very, very large. Mm -hmm. And mostly in a lot of cases, it was larger than the traditional methods of paper-based communication that were going on. So it was a really interesting finding and it got a lot of um, traction. It was widely read and it's still sitting up there on the, uh, in the blog page to have a look at because it's still fresh and a lot of people are looking at it still. And still generating uh, CO2 while we leave it sitting there on the server. But jo <laughs> it Joy, <is>. um, <laughs> from your perspective, is, is it common for people to be surprised at these contributions at, at T, T or level three? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Have you got any example or, you know, what sorts of things, what are some of the reactions or, or some of the issues that come up? Well, when, um, when we were working on the greenhouse gas protocol, most of the other people on the technical working groups were from business and industry. And so they really didn't want to hear what we had to say. They weren't very interested in this idea of tracking the whole supply chain and they didn't think it was at all possible to look at uh, scope three and certainly not in the detail we can do it so we had to uh, convince them we wrote a paper that was published at the time and again it, it became quite influential because like the project that chris has just uh, discussed that was groundbreaking chris that hadn't really been done before no. and when we published this one this uh, in, 10 years ago now this hadn't been this work hadn't been done before and we could show that uh, say the um, 
the uh, uh, publishing sector. Uh, we took it set certain sectors of the economy and we looked at them here. We had uh, co-authors in the US. So we looked at the sector here and uh, where the greenhouse gas emissions were hidden in their supply chain and the US people looked at theirs. They were quite similar in most areas. But uh, for, for the uh, publishing sector here, the top 20 items that came up in, in priority order in, in you know, how much greenhouse gas emission they were contributing to the whole. Um, the top 20 items accounted for 72% of the emissions, but none was in the first tier of the supply chain and only eight were in the second. The rest were buried upstream. So if you'd only looked at your first tier or second tier, you'd have got very little of that supply chain. In fact, you'd have missed 96% of the emissions if you'd only looked at your first and second supply chain, yeah. second tier. I, I get it. Uh, but uh, Chris, do you think uh, what Joy is saying applies also to marketing? Because, you know, we've had a lot of conversations around the opportunities for marketers to actually look at their supply chain and actively uh, start to measure and manage it. And yet often people are inclined to uh, think that it's not an issue for them. Do you think this is uh, the underlying issue? Um, I, I, as Joyce said, that um, it's either a, a will for ignorance because it's actually become simpler because there is, a, if you turn over that stone, there is something you don't necessarily want to see. And <laughs> yeah. if you are claiming to be an environmental business, once you start uh, looking for these things, you're going to find them. And there, there could be a, a bit of that going on. But mm. um, they, yeah, I, I think it's um, a lot of times it's just not looked for, Darren. It really isn't looked for. But people also don't understand. They think because someone else is doing it on their behalf. But we, we did that work uh, years ago when I wrote some methodology for the CO2 counter that um, we used to, to measure uh, marketing emissions. And it was the, the, around TV advertising and people saying, well, the, the, the TV is on anyway. We mm. said, well, any commercial channel wouldn't be functioning if it wasn't for the advertising because that was the thing driving it therefore you have to actually look have to measure what those emissions are if you choose that channel to advertise on you should be responsible for those emissions from those t big uh, tv screens that the consumer is actually taking those messages from you you can't ignore it and say that's the tv station it is your responsibility but that conversation has been a very difficult one over the last 13 14 years darren <laughs> as we both know <laughs> yes <laughs> but uh there's actually an economic reason, isn't there, for reducing uh, CO2 emissions? Because in many ways, uh, going or, or, or greenhouse gas emissions, because in many ways, it also leads to a reduction in waste. You know, if you think about uh, a greenhouse gas emissions or CO2 as a, uh, a measure of activity, uh, reducing them rather than just offsetting them, which was the old way, is actually a way of reducing waste, isn't it, John? Well, yes, I mean, that, that's quite right. We've done quite a bit of study. One of our PhD students um, concentrated on waste and he built some waste tables um, and used the same methodology that we do, we use, but look downstream rather than upstream and followed the waste stream downstream. And uh, yes, of course, it's incredibly important. Uh, and it's such a waste in itself too, because some of that waste, of course, is not waste. I mean, if you look at the circular economy uh, and look at it in those terms, there needn't be much real waste if we just organise ourselves properly. Well, uh, Chris, uh, you've also done a recent project uh, with Sydney University of Sydney uh, with point of purchase or point of sale, looking at uh, there's a big trend with a lot of retailers moving to having their point of purchase electronic, you know, these big electronic screens at uh, point of sale. It provides convenience of being able to change messaging, you know, virtually instantaneously. And it's also uh, often um, justified on the basis of while it's a big financial cost up front, uh, it would reduce waste and, and reduce greenhouse gases because there's no printing or production to act, or very little production to actually uh, put onto those screens. But that's not looking at the whole uh, supply chain, is it? 
No, I think the purpose after the, the Facebook research we did, which demonstrated that any digital marketing messaging that's going out is um, there is a, there is a major footprint. It's not going away because we've gone away from paper. So when you walk down the high street and you look into these stores, even at night when they're closed and we get to, still when the messages coming is being seen, that's actually telling you to buy this good, these goods or services. Um, the question was, I suppose, what is that environmental footprint? But does anybody realize um, do any of these companies that are either claiming the environmental high ground even measure it and look at it? So that was the purpose of, of setting up a, a project to actually look at both forms of in-store marketing, that uh, what was the difference between paper-based, which is the predominant two things are paper-based, which traditional stuff like the banner behind you, Darren, or the, or the digital uh, the digital stuff was more and more being seen on these massive, massive screens that say we're running at night as well. Mm. And um, I was surprised we had, we put that out to a lot of uh, uh, people with um, major retail outlets and we got a lot of response. People wanted to be involved. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, we only got uh, one company who were really, really good and, and plowed on through the difficulties which we've had. And um, I think it opened their eyes. They didn't, they weren't measured. They didn't understand that this was, this was actually um, a big environmental problem. They've got a big sustainability team. They look at everything and they think they're doing the right thing by reducing paper. There's obviously other factors involved, but um, it's something that I hadn't even considered that this would be a footprint. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty becomes also with a lot of um, retail outlets is the way they choose to structure their business if you're franchising those you're even another step removed from the actual the uh the carbon that's being emitted from those stores because you don't physically own someone else is paying the rent and and doing these things so therefore but the responsibility's got to actually sit with the client at the end of the day or you know or the brand at the end of the day because they are actually it's their goods and services that are being sold through these outlets so it, it, it was a, an eye out when, again, uh, not surprisingly, having looked at Facebook, the digital has a major impact compared to paper based. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a good it's a good piece of knowledge, which we're about to share in the next couple of weeks. And um, hopefully other companies will actually go and look at this stuff. We can actually help them look at what this impact is and not necessarily reconfigure the stores, but look at it when designing new stores. Is there a better way from an environmental point of view? So, so in that particular case, Joy, you know, there's obviously the allowance for the, uh, the greenhouse gases in the manufacturing of these screens, uh, the transporting installation, all of those things, aren't, isn't there? But uh, what Chris, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is sharing is that, you know, what they were really only uh, taking into account was the tier one, tier two uh, emissions, not the, the third level. Absolutely. And that, I mean, that third level goes right back to mining whatever needs to be mined to construct the equipment that you need in order to produce whatever it is you're producing. There's the transport between those. It, it is an infinite supply chain, uh, literally, and everything is captured in it. So it's not just the obvious that, you know, um, you can follow a supply chain through thinking that you've got everything if it's say you're making a table and you're tracing it back to the wood that's grown in the forest and chopped down and everything but then there's you know the uniforms of the people that work for this company or there's the trucks that they manage or there's the soft furniture in the office it, it's absolutely the stationery absolutely everything that goes into getting that product to you yeah. It's infinite. <laughs> yeah. So you can't escape. There's actually uh, a suggestion here uh, framed as a question, uh, terrific, from John. He says, has there ever been a more personal approach that talks to creatives, originators, agencies in terms of carbon handprints versus the generic business carbon footprint? Any merit in terms of creating a more tactile responsibility? Interesting question, because I think you know, a lot of people really uh, are left with this sense of, well, you know, it's so hard and so complex, mm. I don't want to uh, participate. Mm. How do we give this context on a, on a personal basis or a, a personal responsibility? 
Well, there, there was a, a lot of work done by the Carbon Trust in the UK, which was around, it was, they called it the carbon footprint. And the, the, the idea was that every product produced that you'd find on the supermarket shelf would have a, a full, fully measured um, supply chain um, life, li life cycle footprint. So you could compare one with the other, which was, um, but unfortunately to do that, you know, ex do that really well in a detailed fashion was too expensive. So there wasn't the take up. Um, so there was a, yeah, so th there has been attempts at that, but like anything, what's the demand? I mean, we look at the moment, what's the demand for people understanding this in the marketing, marketing sphere? It's very low, unfortunately, until someone gets caught out. Because mm -hmm. that, uh, you just mentioned, you know, it's not just the uh, upstream supply chain, it's also lifetime uh, product, you know, mm -hmm. from, from uh, creation to however it ends up in the end, either landfill or recycling or whatever. Uh, Joy, I imagine is that's also part of the uh, measure of the uh, uh, carbon contribution? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we've concentrated mostly on upstream previously, but now with the have it, having the student, uh, PhD student undertake studies on downstream, the waste stream downstream, and also, I mean, talking about upstream and downstream could be, you, you can situate yourself anywhere in the supply chain because yeah. you supply something and then it goes on, but the, the, the um, companies downstream of you that you supply to can also be the starting point and look upstream and will we'll, uh, also include your organization, therefore, in their upstream. So upstream and downstream is relative. It depends where you situate yourself. And, uh, and that's why we, do the work that we do which captures the whole lot because it all comes down to what Chris was talking about in responsibility previously because you can say that well I'm not responsible for that when once it's left me I'm not responsible for it so downstream is nothing to do with me but of course it is because it's the way you design whatever it is you send out downstream that has a great effect on um, how that is managed after it leaves you and what happens to it in the future. So it's all tied up together and you can't really separate any little bits out and say, I'll just pick this bit off and I'll deal with this and this is my responsibility and the rest can be anybody's. And this is probably what leads to the greatest examples of greenwashing is when <laughs> people frame things in very narrow terms yeah. so that it looks the best it could, could possibly be, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yes. We've had a lot of, um, of uh, fun with greenwashing. It's very easy to take some greenwashing down, as Chris mentioned earlier. You can challenge it. Well, and, and uh, because from uh, our perspective, you know, uh, Trinity P3 has uh, signed to uh, communication, Communicators Declare, which is a group of people working in marketing and communications to uh, declare that they will not support uh, uh, carbon uh, polluting uh, clients mm -hmm. or to uh, participate in greenwashing, which I think is a great starting point. Yeah, but yeah. You know, how easy is it when you just reframe a discussion to make it look better uh, immediately that you do that? It's greenwashing. I think we might actually, having a science background, I think we might have an example here. James says, we're in the hemp industry. We're moving from a hydrocarbon economy to a high carbohydrate economy don't mine for a care grow a car except uh, if I remember my organic chemistry the only difference between a, uh, a hydrocarbon and a carbohydrate is it's oxygenated um, I think it still ends up as co2 when you uh, reduce it anyone here uh, any chemists here that want to uh, <laughs> challenge me on that one? Uh, throw that one to you joy <laughs> no, no mine <laughs> Well, I think, uh, sugar, I think, sugar and, and uh, petroleum end up pretty much producing CO2 when they get broken down. So it's uh, not really better or worse either way. Well, I, I think that isn't the, uh, again, I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't comment. I, uh, hemp, I'm assuming, is, is grown as a crop, which must actually be, uh, one would assume that it does actually act as a, a sink for carbon. So therefore, in the, the growing of the, the, the crop, Therefore, it would actually uh, absorb carbon. So therefore, therefore, when it's broken down and produ producing or whatever it is, maybe it does become neutral. There could be an argument for that because it does store carbon, one would assume. 
Now, uh, Chris, you got involved in a bit of an industry controversy uh, a week ago when uh, Coles supermarkets declared that they were no longer going to distribute uh, paper catalogues or printed catalogues and that uh, they were going to rely on having those at point of sale so customers could pick them up if they wanted to or, uh, or rely on using electronic ones. And uh, in fact, uh, a body that has a vested interest in uh, printing because it's had a huge impact on the uh, print industry, this uh, decision, uh, came out with some uh, carbon uh, facts that were probably reframed in the best possible way. Yeah, again, you've got, to, you've got to see where the argument's coming from. It is a lobby group on behalf of the printed industry. They're going to represent their members. Um, so therefore, you can see that. But to me, it was a, a, a strange approach to actually talk about the environmental impacts of one against the other. I, I think there was a, a bit of a claim that from Coles that this would be um, a better for the environment. But really, I think there was obviously a lot of other factors going on uh, with the coals reducing their, you know, quite a substantial print spend on on what is, you know, predominantly one would one could call it junk mail, which has been around forever. So um, you, you can see where it's coming from. I, I think we try to actually give a view on the middle ground. Um, yes, there was a there is a there is um, still a footprint with producing things online. Um, on when you actually did the numbers, um, they were most probably there were some numbers quoted by the the printing um, industry, um, but uh, they looked a bit low. And I think the you know on the subject that we've been talking about, looking at the whole supply chain upstream and downstream, it looked like they didn't include some of the uh, upstream um, effects of of printing, which looked like disposal, which either go to landfill or or hopefully go back to recycling. Um, so therefore, their figures looked a bit rubbery. rubbery. And uh, then you had the whole reason of how targeted, and I think this is the thing we, we talked about earlier, is about waste. When uh, something is put into someone's letterbox, they're not requesting it. You might put no junk mail on your letterbox, therefore you don't want it, but everyone else just gets it, whether they want it or not. That's not targeted. That's mass, mass produced. Mass, mass given out and the figures that um, they were again quoting on how little carbon was in um, per catalog didn't account for the number that went straight into the bin or straight back into that cycle whereas the online one it looks like an opt-in with the Coles catalog therefore you request it because you can opt out and say I do not want it therefore it is highly targeted so when you take those factors in it's good because it's targeted um, it's bad because it's untargeted and compared the two, clearly from an environmental point of view, in this case, one would assume, not having the full figures in front of us, we were just commenting, um, that the online would be more targeted, therefore a better environmental out, uh, uh, impact or out, outcome for uh, coals in, in this case. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, what they were doing were two things. They were actually pr printing a catalogue, which had a carbon footprint, producing online and saving it on the service, which had a carbon footprint, if they stopped doing one or the other, it would automatically reduce the carbon footprint, regardless if they were gonna do both then do one, they must reduce their footprint. So yes, they had a good argument. Was it was the defense of it put up well by the print industry? I don't think so. Mm. Yeah. Because uh, Joy, from your perspective, you know, the real opportunity here is for people to first understand what the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are from their supply chain and then to look for ways of reducing it, isn't it? It's really not about anything other than becoming more efficient and, uh, in the way that you work. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, you, you, if you look at your suppliers and um, there are often many different ways to um, to produce whatever it is you produce. There are different outlets. There are different uh, options for your inputs, and you really need to take account of your inputs. But you you have to do some kind of upstream study to find out um, where all of these things are, are leading to. Um, it, it's not an easy, simple task. I understand that, but it's really necessary 
because so much is hidden further up the chain. Uh, I don't know if you remember the carbon disclosure project that actually asked people to ask their suppliers, their first tier suppliers, to tell them what their carbon input was for whatever it was they were purchasing from that supplier. And then they realized they had to go further upstream and they asked the suppliers to ask their suppliers. And after that, we lost. You know, you can't do it that way. You need a broad sweep of the whole thing. I mean, what we do is top down. It's a big model of the world economy. And so we do top down stuff, but we can show you, uh, we can show you quickly and fairly simply, just from your spend, where the hotspots might be. And then you can go in and look at them really in depth. You know, you, you don't need to waste a lot of time and expense finding the hotspots before you find you realize how you can change things or uh, what the alternatives are to that purchase. Um, so I think, although it seems complicated, it's doable and it's a shortcut and save you a lot of expense um, if you want to really reduce your footprint and you're really serious about finding where the danger spots are, where the hotspots are and doing something about it. Once you know that, you can make choices. Mm. Certainly, from a marketing point of view, you would want to do that type, that depth of work before mm. you even considered going out and making any sort of claims or, or, mm. or statements mm. around that. Because you know, as we've seen time and time again, it just ends up, you know, you, you end up with mud on your face. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, Chris, uh, from your perspective, where do you think the opportunities are for the marketing and advertising industry here? Because I know you've done work with the CO2 counter in media, uh, in various production, in print production, in digital production and, and digital delivery. You know, where would, should or could marketers start working? It's, um, it's firstly, if, if the business is environmental policy is to, is to reduce their carbon footprint or their environmental impact. Um, so there's a lot more to carbon that goes on in the environmental world. But if we focus on carbon, if, if their policy long term, whatever that might be, three, five years is to reduce it or to eliminate it or to neutralize it, um, they can't ignore the third party, uh, the scope three um, emissions. Um, so therefore, they are spending a lot of money these big companies on advertising, um, they need to take that into account. Now, they don't necessarily know where those problems are going to be. So it's like doing an audit. So you actually have to go out and do an audit to understand what your current spend is, how it's split by channel, where are the biggest impacts. And then they need to have, you know, once they have a, understand that and see that in, in, in a plain manner, they can then have discussions with all their stakeholders um, you know, up, upstream, downstream to see what best, obviously, is going to be some vested interest. People will actually say, pick me, pick me, but it can actually come from an environmental point of view and they can start weighing the decision on where to actually place that media. So by turning off all their paper and going to digital will not solve their problem. They need to see how that affects and do it. And obviously, to put a weight in, in any decision they make from an environmental, from a marketing buy point of view in place. So be it 10% of the decision making or 20%, let's hopefully as high it is, but if it's just 10% of any decision on where to place their media is environmental, it will start moving where they place it to become lower carbon uh, input. But first of all, they actually have to understand what's going on at the moment. I mean, Coles have now, you know, do understand there's a good conversation with Coles going on. Mm -hmm. They understand and there's some, there's some information going out and a good discussion about what's, what the impacts are. So the next person who looks at that can understand it a bit more. I think the point of sale one, again, it, I think it's a bigger one. It's around property. It's around, you know, how they construct these things. But to, to have that information in front of you, when you start making those other business decisions, you can then put the environmental information in there as well to, to sway that decision as well. So, so to answer is understand what's currently happening in the way you approach the market with your goods and services is the first thing you should do. And from there, you can then actually share that information and make more um, informed decisions. It's all we're asking people to do. We don't expect people to actually to stop advertising. It's actually when you do, if you believe in 
or you have a policy to reduce your impact, understand what you're currently doing in, in your marketing spend. Yeah, terrific. Uh, look, I've just got to go back and uh, apologise to James. I misrepresented him. He's actually, <laughs> he did actually mean that his uh, hemp was uh, carbon capture. So a great way of actually right. capturing yeah. carbon in there. Uh, what threw me was the hydrocarbon and the carbohydrate. So, uh, but uh, back to you, Joy. I'm really interested in the, the work that you do as a group. I imagine would be primarily with uh, you know, sort of senior management rather than marketing. Have you ever actually been engaged from a marketing perspective or is it really more supply chain? That's right, yes, it's a good question. Uh, I think the only, the only um, contact I've had with anyone to do with marketing is through Chris. Uh, it's not something that we usually get asked about. And um, most of the work that our group does is um, these days, I think with, uh, I mean, we do a lot of primary research, but uh, a lot of the work that they do is with say the World Bank or the OECD or um, the, you know, big sort of organizations like that, government stuff. Uh, we don't do quite so much work as we did with individual companies doing fo footprints for companies and things like that. So, no, we haven't. I haven't had anything um, at all to do with your angle, the, the kinds of issues that are front and uh, of your mind in this in this space. And it's interesting, isn't it, Chris? Because uh, when we have conversations with uh, procurement teams, and you know, often uh, procurement is seen as uh, the enemy by um, some marketers and certainly uh, some agencies. Uh, procurement is well ahead on this. I mean, the idea of uh, environmentally sustainable sourcing, ethically responsible sourcing, socially responsible sourcing, these are big issues amongst uh, procurement people, but it doesn't seem to have moved through to marketing. No, I, I, I really don't, I don't understand at all while it's not there. And we have been pushing this for, for quite a while to say, start understanding, but it, it, it's just not there. Whether it's too, too far removed from what the environmental policy is, um, it is a different team, sustainability teams uh, within organisations. Do, do they actually speak to the marketing teams? I don't think at all. I've been surprised in, in, a, in a couple of major organisations when we've helped them uh, go to market to find new um, uh, print, print providers. Um, and I always ask the question, is when you're looking for someone, do you want someone who will measure the emissions from this? And they scramble away, go and ask, and uh, procurement and, and sustainability team are delighted that um, you can actually do this now. And uh, they, uh, they grasp it and put it into their reporting lines. Mm. We, we do stuff for government organisations who want um, the publications they consume each year. They want to understand mm. what the emissions are to, to include into their, their total sustainability um, uh, reporting. But um, it's, very, uh, it's, it's very small. And again, we keep encouraging marketing to get on the front foot, but um, we are not getting much traction at the moment. Maybe the Coles conversation gets them to think again, because there is some, you know, that is an environmental argument that's going on. You don't want to be called, a, a, a brand doesn't want to be caught in that. They want to be very clear what's going on and be able to say exactly what they're doing, why they're doing it and what the impact was or wasn't. Yeah, because Joy, there's certainly a, an increasing uh, focus and interest from a business perspective, from a legislative perspective around this, uh, this idea of you know, increasing sustainability, isn't there, globally? Yes, there is. And can I mention something else? You mentioned social sustainability just a minute ago and, um, and procurement. And this is off track, but I'll come back to um, emissions. Sure. Um, at the moment, my focus is on uh, modern slavery in the supply chain. Oh, terrific. And, it's a big um, issue. It's a big issue. And we have the Modern Slavery Act now, and some of your listeners may well be uh, having to report under the Act. Um, and we've been looking at this from the same supply chain perspective. But a recent paper that we put on our Modern Slavery um, Research website was about the link between modern slavery and greenhouse gas emissions. Ah, okay, that's interesting. Because a lot of the um, 
the uh, uh, low technology production sites in, in um, the global south, in third world economies. Um, they, they don't have the technologies that we have and so their production methods are often high greenhouse gas emission uh, sites and many of those uh, very poorly maintained and poorly supplied uh, and supported sites are subject to modern slavery. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of slavery, say in the brick kilns across the top of uh, India and Pakistan and into Bangladesh, there's a big brick kiln uh, um, ban there because of the terrain, uh, the geology of the place. And they have, uh, they're notoriously um, recognized for bonded labor. But those brick kilns are high emission uh, workplaces. And yes, so, they're not exactly the most efficient, are they? No, that's right. And so there's a lot of overlaps between modern slavery and greenhouse gas emissions. And we've just written this paper to say that if you, if you address one, you can address both. And wouldn't that be good, hey? Mm. Well, in fact, uh, John's just uh, made a comment. Maybe there needs to be a communications ethics and environment director within organisations to actually pull this all together. That's it. Fantastic, yeah. Well, as Chris said, you know, uh, when he's dealing with procurement versus marketing versus yep. uh, sustainability, corporate strategy, you know, they've all got parts of this on their agenda, but there's mm. no one looking at the overall organisation. And certainly the CEO's too busy to uh, be pulling all those levers. Mm, well, what a good idea. Yeah, we'll terrific idea. Together. Um, so, Joy, so Joy, do you think there's a, a direct correlation between slavery? Is it been much research in this area to, to actually put research in environmental impact? It's coming. The research, yep. there is some research on it. And um, the, the paper I've just been talking about is on the OASIS website at the University of Sydney, O A S I S, OASIS. Mm -hmm. uh, open access to I can't remember what, I can't remember what it stands for, and we made it up. But anyway, <laughs> you find it there. <laughs> and uh, it's um, more than a three-letter acronym. That's the yes, you know, you went right. to five. That's right. I can't we all know before. everyone can remember three letters, but five the is the Oasis two. project. Uh, it's uh, obviously uh, six. Uh, our analysis, uh, our um, analysis for modern slavery in the supply chain, and. Uh, we're working with a good team. Um, I, don't, I don't know what any of, uh, any of you know about the modern slavery um, debate that's going on at the moment, but one of the people prominent in that, Darian McBain, who was at Thai Union Seafood until very recently, was a PhD graduate of our group. And so she is looking at this from our perspective, from this supply chain perspective, and she's won numerous awards around the world for her work in modern slavery. I mean, back in the 70s, when we first heard about the triple bottom line, you know, yes. this idea of social, economic and, and uh, ethical responsibility. That's right. um, and, and, you know, today, uh, I think you know, what you were saying makes sense. It's mm -hmm. not just, uh, th you know, third world or, or, or uh, poor nations it also comes down to uh, legislative sophistication the yeah. ability to actually enforce that mm -hmm. uh, on, on an individual basis because mm -hmm. there are some markets that you know are more uh, financially uh, wealthy but mm -hmm. have poor um, uh, legislative and uh, and uh, government processes so you know it, it's an issue globally yeah. because as more and more uh, Western cultures especially, are looking to source from low cost uh, yep. markets. There actually could be, uh, well, and are inadvertently supporting, mm -hmm. you know, not just slavery and, so, uh, and poor social responsibility, but also environmental responsibility. Absolutely, they're, they're entwined. You can't separate these things. Uh, I don't want to imply that all of this modern slavery um, takes place elsewhere. Modern slavery is in every country. There's, yeah. there's slavery here. Yes, uh, and, and we've seen reports about that. Yes. Yeah. Chris, uh, we're, we're just, uh, we're coming towards the end of the, uh, the webinar, and I'm just wondering if there's a piece of advice 
that you'd like to give either uh, marketers or agencies around, you know, what they should, what's a good first step or what should they be considering? I think the I'm first gonna ask you the same, Joy, so prepare. I, I, I think the first thing to do is to, if you're a marketer, you know, actually find out what the environmental policy is and go and have a look at what you're currently doing. Do an audit and understand, you know, it, it can be a broad sweep thing or a detailed thing because budgets are a bit tight, but uh, at the moment, with the way business it is, but understand what you're currently doing. Terrific. From an environmental point of view. Yeah? Okay. Joy? Mm. Well, I mean, obviously, um, with Chris there, you need to know what you're doing already. You need to do um, an audit. You need to take stock of your supply chain um, in whatever way you can. Preferably the way that we've been talking about here that uh, gives you the whole of your tier three um, and your full supply chain. But if you can't manage that, of course, that's not always possible as far as you can. Okay. Look, I, I want to thank you both for uh, making the time this afternoon to uh, come and talk about this issue of uh, you know, reducing uh, carbon pollution or, to your point, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the marketing communication supply chain. So uh, thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thanks, Thanks. for the opportunity. Yeah. And uh, we'll just go back here. As I... Uh, said at the start, we've recorded this, so uh, it'll be available in the next 24 hours. I would ask people, uh, if you haven't already, to subscribe at trinityp3.com forward slash subscribe so that we can keep you up to date. We want you to opt in rather than us uh, spam you to uh, Chris's point. <laughs> We've, uh, we've had, this comes to the end of the latest group of uh, webinars that we've actually been hosting uh, over the last, uh, few months and uh, some of those webinars have been around uh, making marketing strategies stick, how independent agencies can get a head start on landing corporate clients, unlocking performance post lockdown, innovation, innovating broadcast production and uh, media investment in a recession. Of course, today's uh, on uh, reducing carbon pollution. So there's a lot there and you can access all of them at trinityp3.com forward slash webinars. They're all there, uh, the recordings, the notes from the sessions and uh, also further reading on all those topics. So if you get, get the opportunity, uh, please go and, uh, and check that out. Uh, there'll also be at the end of this, uh, an opportunity to give us feedback with a, uh, a survey monkey survey. So it'd be terrific to know what you uh, think of the session. Uh, more information is available on our blog. Uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn or Facebook. And uh, we have offices in Sydney, Singapore, London and New York. Again, uh, thank you, Joy Murray. Thank you, Christopher Sewell for making the time. And uh, I hope everyone has a terrific day.